Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Andreas. Thanks for uh, coming here to the Great White Internet and watching my talk. Uh, it's about the physical layer and field bus system systems, or um, more precisely, uh, how we can use it to enhance security in those systems as we are in a security summer school. So let's uh, start with an outline. Uh, at first, I will give a little introduction tell you a bit of, uh, about myself, you might not already know, and uh, then um, we'll look at some technical background stuff uh, about electronics and signal processing you might already know from school or university, um, which is nice to have for what comes later in the talk, but also um, for the workshop I'm giving on the same topic. Um, and afterwards, we'll, we'll look at uh, what actually we want to do with this, um, with this scientific physical layer security stuff and uh, how we can implement it and um, then uh, look at the future a bit and then we'll have a question and discussion time. Okay, now uh, something about me and um, what exactly this physical layer I'm talking about uh, um, actually is. So that's me, uh, I mean, this is me, and uh, the guy in the photo is me as well. I guess you see him maybe here. Um, also, uh, you might remember me as the uh, electric shock guy from the um, promo video we did. Um, I'm trying to, uh, or probably uh, today, the, the dangers of this are, are pretty low. Um, Maybe you see me get one in the workshop or not. Um, okay, my research topic, uh, as you might have guessed, is physical layer security on field bus systems, which this presentation is about. Um, yeah, <laughs> my favorite activities are looking at lots of waveforms um, on oscilloscopes and trying to gather some information from them, uh, soldering together strange circuits like this one, for example, more on that later. And uh, yeah, making let, let's blink. Um, you might laugh, but actually that's one A. Uh, that's in, in embedded hardware, that's a great way of debugging. OK. So um, the physical layer, what's that? Uh, formally, it's <laughs> layer one of the OSI network model you might have uh, seen at university if you study some uh, computer science related field. Um, what it actually means, it's just the uh, electric stuff on the wire or on the air or whatever medium you're um, looking at. Um, it's the, the layer where the bits get actually transported along the medium. Um, Here's an analogy um, in human speech, what I'm doing right now. The physical layer would be the sound waves in air coming out of uh, my mouth without the upper, uh, um, the upper interpretation of the words, or maybe the phonemes. Um, this is an uh, example of uh, RS-232, uh, the physical layer of RS-232, which is um, basically the old computer serial port, which also gets um, used as a field bus nowadays uh, in some industrial control things. Um, so topically related. Um, you can see here the waveform of a, of a K that gets sent uh, over the wire. Um, it's uh, voltage amplitude over time, and you can see the single bits um, get transported by uh, either a positive or a negative voltage. OK. Um, now to the technical background. As I said, uh, it's not only for the talk, but also for the workshop later. So uh, we are just uh, looking at some, some very basic stuff, um, which you should know um, to, so to understand if I drop some words like uh, voltage frequency and all that stuff which I already did in the last slide. So um, back to school. 
Uh, some things you might remember from school or some university introductory course or something else. Um, um, if I'm talking about uh, voltage or current, uh, which are measured, measured in volts uh, and amperes respectively, um, that these are related um, um, units basically that uh, tell you something about how strong some electric signal is. Um, it's uh, basically we always see that as some kind of amplitude over time. Um, just uh, remember if you see some, if you see volt or uh, ampere or uh, watts for power anywhere, then um, that's just uh, strength of an electrical signal and um, the strength will have some kind of, uh, um, will either be high or low for uh, different bit states. Um, there's also frequency I'll be talking about a lot um, later on. Uh, that's, um, you might know that it's uh, measured in hertz, um, meaning um, a, a revolution per second, maybe. Um, um, it's, uh, you can find it in, in uh, musics as well if ele uh, as electrical signals is basically when something goes up and down very fast and periodically. Uh, okay, yeah, that's what we see here. Um, this is how many electrical signals uh, look if you measure them with an old uh, analog oscilloscope. Um, as I said, amplitude can be voltage, current, or power. Um, and uh, usually they transport some kind of information, be it digital information, or you could also have a sound wave um, transported as an electrical signal in an analog way. Um, on the upper part of the, um, of the uh, oscilloscope, we see uh, a sine wave um, that could, per, for example, be a be an uh, an audio wave, a very uh, clear one. Let's say that. Um, okay, so um, now we have analog signals. Um, that's fine and good, but uh, we want to uh, get them in a computer and uh, do something with them. Now, the problem with the computer is he, he can't, uh, can't really do with, with continuous signals as we have seen them uh, in the last slide. It has to um, digitize, it has to um, make them non-continuous, it has to sample them. Um, prefer preferably, it has to do that at, uh, at a high speed and very precise. So. Um, uh, that's because um, if we uh, if we only are very slow in measuring the signal, then we can't, uh, of course, measure high frequencies. We'll see why uh, in one or two slides. Um, the other thing um, is uh, quantization noise. You'd like to uh, not have. Um, that's basically the precision with which um, the uh, the samples are decided, you will also see that. Um, conversely, while you want this, uh, both of these things to be very precise and very, very, very fast, um, you have one large uh, drawback that's um, cost and uh, data size. Um, because if you're sampling at high speeds, you get a lot of samples, you get a lot of data, you might not be able to handle that. Okay, this is uh, an example of a waveform which gets uh, sampled and quantized. Basically, um, you have this um, analog waveform um, in, in yellow and the blue balls represent um, the, the values the um, computer which measures this waveform will assign to it. As the computer can only um, basically assign um, um, integer values. Um, it um, can only 
uh, align the balls along this grid, this grid which you might see next to me. And um, so uh, there's some, um, as you can see, there's some inaccuracy. But um, if you look at the, at the, um, if you in your mind, if you connect those dots, it will still look pretty much like the original waveform. So um, it's not not a bad um, bad sample, right? Not a bad quantization at, uh, in this um, example. But now, if we uh, look at this, where um, where there's another faster uh, waveform, smaller waveform um, superimposed on the old one. Um, it looks a bit different because, uh, as we can see, this uh, this waveform is um, or this frequency we have superimposed is uh, actually faster than the sample rate, um, meaning uh, it does it uh, it does go up and down in between uh, two samples. Um, and uh, uh, the computer will not be able to catch that, as we can see. The, um, if you connect the dots here, it will still look pretty much like before. Um, what it means is um, to uh, we need a high sample rate to uh, catch high frequencies. Indeed, we need, uh, as there's something called Nyquist's theorem, which tells us that um, in order to sufficiently reconstruct a waveform uh, or an arbitrary frequency, we need to sample it with at least double its frequency. Now we have sampled that data and we can have fun with it in a computer. Uh, one thing you can do is, um, and we will um, do a lot, uh, at least in the workshop and um, also in uh, one of the examples I'm going to show you, is um, put the data from amplitude over time into the frequency domain, uh, meaning um, to, to, to see from which frequencies the signal we're looking at is made up. And um, the, um, the um, word to look for here is uh, the Fourier transform is the most well-known uh, mathematical thing to, which, which does that. You don't really need to know anything about that, other than it tells you <laughs> which frequencies um, are in a in a signal. Um, this is a plot. You can uh, a plot of these these um, frequencies contained in the signals. Um, on on the left, we we see uh, two. Um, peaks, which are um, the original two um, signs um, from which the, uh, the, the original analog waveform was calculated. Um, and uh, this looks well and good. Now if we um, look at uh, uh, the second waveform, we see that there's another peak. Uh, this is the, um, the, the higher frequency, um, smaller waveform that got superimposed, which you can s nicely see here. Um, also, I have um, superimposed a, uh, I have put in lines which, which show you uh, the original sample rate, meaning um, the one uh, you could see in the picture with the blue balls. And um, the Nyquist frequency is half it, so uh, if we had only sampled uh, the, the signal with um, this original sample rate, um, we wouldn't have been able, uh, we had, would have only been able to see the peaks left of the original Nyquist frequency and all the other things right of it would be lost to us. Um, right. Now uh, that we are brushed up on um, electrical stuff and signal processing, um, we'll look at KNX very quickly. I believe um, you've heard of it uh, by now in another talk. Um, it's a building automation system which we uh, like to use for, for experiments here. Uh, 
because it's also a field bus and um, wh quite widely used. Uh, and as you probably have heard in the uh, last talks, it has um, security flaws. Basically, you can just um, hack into it by uh, removing a light switch and, and connecting to the, um, to the network. And then you can do fun stuff like uh, switch on and off the lights and stuff. Anyway, uh, this makes it perfect as a basis for, basis for my research. Um, OK, now um, the, the part of KNX we are specifically looking at is called KNX TP. It's the, um, the one um, part of KNX which really uh, connects, for example, light switches with the lights or the controller with the AC unit or something. Um, essentially, it's a serial connection. It's quite similar to the RS232 one we, we've seen before. Um, with the notable exception that it does um, deliver power over its line um, with approximately 30 volts DC uh, and a couple tens of milliampere of current. Um, it goes uh, over a twisted pair copper wire, so uh, which looks a bit like like Ethernet. Um, this is the physical layer of KNX TP. Basically, it's what you're seeing is a um, is a zero bit. Um, so basically, every time a KNX device sends a zero over the wire, uh, this happens. It pulls down um, the voltage. Um, one thing you should um, see in this di diagram is uh, what what you should should think about is that. Uh, um, as it's written, it's AC coupled, meaning um, zero volt in this case means 30 volts. Um, it basically blocks the, um, the uh, um, power over the line, so um, we only see the change in voltage. OK, so it first um, pulls the bus lower than, um, than the resting voltage by about well, six, six, seven volts. Um, holds it for 35 microseconds um, and then lets it back up again. Um, then over swings a bit, which has to do with the power supply of KNX, then um, flattens out over 69 microseconds and then the whole thing begins again. Um, okay, yeah, that's uh, what happens on the wire and this is what we uh, capture when we do physical layer analysis. OK, this is a bit about uh, timing. It's not very important uh, just to, to um, um, give you an idea. Um, as I said, whole thing is, uh, is uh, 35 plus, um, what was it, 69 microseconds makes uh, 104 microseconds per bit. That's uh, because it has a... Uh, 9.6 kbit per second um, speed. Um, and then we have uh, yeah, single messages, messages composed of 13 bits. And then we have packets, packets composed of many of those. Um, actually, that's not that bad, because the uh, speed requirements to um, to accurately sample that or oversample that so that we can see a nice waveform aren't so critical as you would have, for example, in Ethernet, which is much, much faster. Um, then again, you, if you get uh, really long packets then uh, and you sample at a high rate, it can happen that you get quite uh, large files. Um, OK, just. Uh, little summary slide of the, the introduction, basically. Um, as I said, remember what voltage and current is, uh, what a frequency is, also for the workshop. And uh, we have seen what an electrical signal looks like, how we can measure it, how we can look at it, and we have seen K and X. That's uh, so far for the first part. And uh, now we're going into my research. Um, First, some definitions, mostly about uh, what physical layer security actually means. 
Uh, and then um, some of our wishes and expectations and what ca it can actually deliver and uh, then a general idea how to how to approach that that problem um, so um, field bus in general um, little refresher probably heard it in another talk um, it's a type of computer network used for controlling stuff in industry, in buildings, as I said with KNX. Uh, it's usually local area and um, real-time direct control. So a lot of them are, are um, technically rather similar to either RS-232 to KNX or similar serial connections. Uh, and physical layer security means um, generally that we uh, listen very hard to what happens on the on the cable um, on, the, on these buses or also on the air um, if it's not physical layer security on field buses as I do um, and unique to try and uniquely identify um, some devices like for a KNX it would be trying to uh, uniquely identify uh, the, the device is connected to a, uh, a lighting line, the controller, the, uh, the switches, the lights, or the AC unit, or whatever. Um, and also in uniquely um, identifying the environment, um, meaning um, how the cables are connected and uh, how long they are and all that. And uh, the the, the way we do that is by analyzing the electrical characteristics of the, uh, the signals and giving it a unique, um, a unique signature, what is usually called a fingerprint. Um, most approaches do, the, do this passively by, as I said, uh, listen very hardly, um, in this case meaning with an oscilloscope or similar hardware. But it's also possible to do a bit uh, like ultrasonic radar-like stuff, basically feed something into the cable and see what comes out. Um, so um, we can see we can uniquely identify devices. Um, so we should be able to to um, to um, make to build an intrusion detection device with this basically basically so uh, if some some device uh, comes in the network and uh, is unknown then we could uh, say um, um, I don't know raise an alarm or something um, yeah okay um, now but uh, what we actually want to do um, when we uh, to implement a security on this, um, yeah, on this insecure KNX system. In this case, is um, we'd actually like to uh, implement comprehensive security, meaning um, conf confidentiality, availability, and integrity. Uh, and uh, also, we'd like to do that cheaply and without uh, harming any of the devices in the network or causing them to be replaced. Uh, of course, it's wishful thinking, because in reality, with uh, this physical layer security, at least, um, we can only do intrusion detection, as said. We can decide, okay, this device is fine, or no, I don't know this device. Don't hear, uh, don't listen to it. But uh, we won't be able to encrypt the data traffic without uh, using that. It's something unrelated. Um, Nevertheless, uh, intrusion detection is nice. It's uh, enhanced security. It's not uh, the solution to everything, but um, you know, you could use it as a as a part of something else, of a bigger effort, basically. Um, I said we also want to do it cheaply. Um, that's actually possible because uh, counterintuitively, um, you think, okay, all hardware, you need to measure stuff. Uh, but no, uh, as it turns out, at least for, for KNX, um, the cost is comparatively manageable. Um, 
nevertheless, of course, there's effort involved designing the devices uh, um, and um, putting them into the network, uh, adding them into the infrastructure. It's, it's not a completely easy goal. Um, and uh, also, we don't want to harm devices. OK, if you're just listening, no harm done usually. Uh, with the active probing, I, I mentioned, OK, <laughs> yeah, we have, of course, to um, to look at what we uh, feed into the network if it's, um, yeah, I mean, it could potentially be harmful, let's say that. Um, OK, now um, what I actually did, um, my three ideas I, I implemented, um, First one, passive fingerprinting. Um, it's adapted from um, from something uh, uh, a few guys uh, did in 2019 um, on wireless stuff. They were basically listening very hard to to Wi-Fi traffic and uh, then classifying the transmitters. Um, I thought we could probably do the same on a wire with a, with, um, with an os USB oscilloscope, uh, and um, the the general approach of the uh, of the f passive fingerprinting thing was that basically we throw math at the data until it gives up and becomes uh, classifiable. Uh, so uh, quite a bit of analysis effort uh, until we get some kind of uh, some kind of answer, is this the device or is it an Im imposter? Um, okay, second idea was a more directed approach um, about uh, to measure a device's noise print, basically. Um, as we've seen before, there's this, um, in KNX, there's this phase where we have a, where the device pulls down the voltage at every zero. To do that, it needs to uh, sink current from the bus. It, uh, the current needs to flow from the bus through the device so the voltage goes down. Uh, this is the, one of these um, relationships between voltage and current I was talking about. Um, what this means is current flows through the device, through the components in the device, and usually components in devices have some tolerances and are not uh, like perfect. Um, they have manufacturing defects, um, not in the sense that they don't work, but that they have some, they are basically a bit different than, uh, um, at, or maybe let's say every resistor that comes out of, of the factory is a bit, bit different. And one of these, um, these things where, it, where it is, uh, gets obvious is, is noise because every um, when current flows through a component, it induces some kind of noise um, into the uh, into the current uh, flow, basically. Um, basically uh, explained in a in a physically questionable way, but. Uh, I guess we can accept it. Um, and uh, okay, so um, I thought maybe during that uh, phase we can just see how uh, much noise is this in the in the system, and then decide which uh, which device is transmitting. Um, now the third implementation idea um, is this active probing thing I was uh, talking about uh, in this case we just um, put high frequency signals into the network meaning uh, we, we basically send something that would usually that would normally uh, go out an antenna we send it over the wire um, the the good thing about that is that um, the amplitude is very low the frequency is very high and basically it uh, does not register um, next to the uh, normal k and x traffic and uh, if we do that for a series of frequencies, then we can um, map out a frequency spectrum of the network. Uh, I come to a little later what it means. Okay, now the practical implementations uh, of these ideas. 
the more detailed idea for passive fingerprinting now uh, that we want to capture packets generated by a KNX button and uh, then try to um, find out if it's this one or that one. As you can see, or I hope you can see, these are um, both the same model, but two different devices. Um, and we want to uh, find out when we connect this one to a KNX network and then, uh, oops, my bad, and then use such a nice USB oscilloscope to uh, capture the packet it sends whenever we push one of these buttons. Um, we want to do that a lot of times, push these buttons and then swap out uh, against the other the other switch and then uh, try to find some differences in the data. Uh, a little more um, detail on the data analysis part. Um, once we uh, then have this data, uh, we need to trim, uh, trim it uh, down to the packets we want to look at actually and then um, yeah, uh, the mathematical part as I said, uh, throw math at the data until it gives up. Um, the long version is we perform a Hilbert transform on every packet which is something similar, similar to this Fourier uh, frequency spectrum transform I was talking about but even more complicated and um, it yields something called instantaneous phase and instantaneous frequency, instantaneous frequency. Um, so basically you then have amplitude instantaneous phase, instantaneous frequency, which are all um, time-based signals, um, so free time-based signals through this transform. Then we uh, calculate statistical moments on them, mean, variance, quaternus, and skewness. Uh, so we get three times four um, measures for or features for every uh, button press, which um, is a 12D vector. Ha. Um, so basically we have a high dimensional representation of the data generated by pressing this button once. Um, and we have a lot of these two, two 12D directors because we press the button for every uh, of these switches I think about 300 times or something. Um, Okay, uh, then um, you have 12D data. That's not ideal because how to look at 12D data, I don't know. Uh, or yeah, I do know. Um, there's something called PCA, Principal Component Analysis. analysis. It's some um, not quite machine learning thing which finds the best uh, projection of a, or tries to find the best project projection of a high dimensional data set into a View human viewable um, um, number of dimensions. In our case, we, we uh, protected it down to two two D. Uh, the, this is generally a bit better than just discarding dimension because uh, it it takes uh, all the dimensions into account and makes a linear recombination into a uh, less dimensional space. Uh, yeah, and then um, we want to see if there are clusters of data. And now, did that work? It did. Um, this is the result. Uh, as we can see, um, let me check. Um, yeah, uh, switch A was this one. This is the blue one. This is the yellow one, switch B. And as you can see, they actually did have um, this similar, um, basically there were, were differences in the data. We can't actually say from this which these, these differences were because uh, there was so much, uh, so much signal processing involved. But um, yes, um, given enough samples, uh, each of these points is one button press basically. The large um, blue and yellow crosses um, are uh, um, I'm always po pointing to the uh, <laughs> to the TV showing the slide in front of me. I'm sorry. I should probably po uh, point next to me. Anyway, um, 
the blue and yellow crystals represent the, the means of these uh, point clouds. And as we, as we can su uh, see, they are quite distinct. And uh, this shows us that we can, given we have a few button presses or a few messages sent from a device to be more general, um, then we can discern them and say, um, okay, no, you are not the, yeah, this one is not the yellow one, for example. And there is a sound. Um, <laughs> Somebody is uh, building something big there. Um, okay, so we've seen um, passive fingerprinting does work. Yeah, great. Um, right, but now for the more directed approach, which is maybe a bit more, um, which you can grasp uh, in a more intuitive way, I would say. Um, we we basically make the data capturing um, same like last time we press the buttons uh, a lot of times at this time uh, this time we we do uh, four sets of button presses where we switch them around twice so we um, we control for for stuff like heating and and this we, because at the time we thought maybe this might make a difference um, okay as said only look at the first uh, 35 microseconds of each zero. Um, I told you about uh, why this noise thing happens. There's a citation um, which will, which goes into detail about that, which kind of components do which kind of noise. Um, it's a kind of an arcane science. So for the data analysis part of the device noise uh, characteristics experiment, um, here, the analysis part is a bit less mathematical than um, before, um, but maybe a bit more involved because we need to cross-correlate um, the, the different uh, waveforms of the button presses, uh, meaning we need to align them on top of each other so that um, all the, uh, the beginnings of the zeros are, are aligned with each other because then we can look at each uh, sample of um, all the button presses and um, calculate uh, for this sample a standard deviation between the presses, uh, which is a measure of, of uh, device noise at that point. Um, we also then um, uh, cross-correlate again uh, in another direction and average standard deviation to get more resolution. It's not really important, just so you know. So you know. Um, and then we plot it, and does that work? Yes, it does. Um, as you can see, again, blue and yellow, and again, they are different. And again, we, we are able to tell, you, um, to tell which is which. Um, not quite as beautiful as uh, with a point cloud, but uh, actually even more, uh, even better separated. Um, okay, so this was uh, the passive stuff. It did work, at least on two devices. Um, I mean, the impressive thing, I think, was that uh, actually we could show that um, two de devices of the same make and model actually were different. Um, okay, so... Um, for the active high frequency probing, um, going back to the idea, um, the assumption is that every wired physical network uh, has a unique frequency response curve. Actually, that also goes for, for wireless environment and pretty much anything. Um, the reason for, for a, in a wired network is that um, cables have inductance and capacitance which is uh, electronics stuff, basically. Um, you don't really need to know a lot of about, um, apart from that, it's, um, that it has an outsized effect on high frequency conductance of the, um, of the cable. Um, and uh, inductance and capacitance vary across uh, devices, cables, cable length, etc. 
Um, so um, the, the what we thought is we can um, we can see that if anything in the um, uh, network changes, then it becomes an another then it gets another uh, frequency response or a change in frequency response. Um, one of the um, the upsides of this would be that we don't need uh, actual network traffic on the on the cables. Um, the technical implementation here is a bit <laughs> a bit more complicated than um, uh, before. Uh, as you can see um, in the pictures, we used a nano nano VNA. Um, it's a yeah, as I wrote, it's a cheap little device uh, which can map the frequency response of a connected circuit. Uh, basically, it has an sorry, it has an output and an input, and from the output, it sends um, um, a variable set of RF frequencies and then sees what comes back uh, back into the input. Um, to have that work with KNX, uh, yeah, we had to. Uh, trick a bit, um, we had to cheat a bit maybe, uh, actually not really, we had to uh, just, we had to develop um, our own hardware stuff a bit so that uh, on the one hand um, we can use it while uh, where KNX is active, uh, is active and not um, get into interaction with the bus traffic and also not fry the device because um, as said there's 30 volts uh, on a KNX line, which is which be much too much to uh, connect to the input of the VNA, which is normally rather used to to um, check on passive circuitry or um, to measure antennas, for example. Um, and here, the results um, it works too. <laughs> um, to explain, um, this is a plot. Um, you get from the nano VNA when you take the data into the computer, it has a USB port for that. Um, it's um, gain versus frequency. Uh, gain in decibels, so logarithmic. Um, basically a gain of zero on a specific frequency would be, would mean that um, Exactly that, what goes out also comes back. So gain minus 40 means a lot less come, uh, comes back than goes out. Um, but that's not really um, the issue. Um, the, it's um, expected there would be a lot, a lot of loss due to our um, um, adapters we, we had to develop. Um, but um, we can see that uh, without going into detail which uh, frequency is what and all that, that the curves of frequency response are um, quite different between um, connecting, for example, no device to a, to a line, connecting um, one of these PCBs to a line or connecting one of these switches to a line. Um, in the same vein, um, there's a, uh, a very um, large difference between, um, for example, having this switch, measuring this switch with a, in one meter of distance or in six meters of distance. Um, so yes, uh, results are we can see um, differences both in the environment or the medium and, uh, and with, uh, with the connected devices. So every time someone removes a device from, from a network or uh, plugs something in, there's a however large, um, large change uh, in, the, in the frequency response curve. Um, there's some drawback, uh, as we've seen later, the larger the network gets, um, the less of an effect has, um, has a single device that or has a Basically, if you have a small network, small changes uh, will be viewable. If you have a very large network, small changes might not be. Um, yeah. 
Okay, so um, that were my, uh, my um, that was my work over the last year, basically. Um, now uh, to give you a little summary on for what you can, um, so what you should uh, maybe remember from this talk. Uh, yes, physical layer security can help with intrusion intrusion detection because if you can. Uh, classify devices if you can decide which device is which you can say mm -hmm. you're not uh, I don't know this device you're not allowed here you must be the intruder trying to take over the network um, there are some limitations as said passive listening okay you need traffic to listen to if um, if um, the bus has not much activity you might not get uh, um, whole lots of, of uh, chances to, to um, see any differences in the network. Um, also, there's some latency. Um, I didn't really say that explicitly, but as you saw, um, we had to, we, we pushed this button like 300 times and then uh, did the whole signal analysis part and stuff. Even if you, if you automate that, um, takes a while to, to actually detect an attack. It might actually be too late then because uh, the attack has already happened like in half a second or something. Um, okay, and um, the, the most promising thing um, seems actually the active probing, to be the active probing because um, we, we showed that it was both sensitive to change in, changes in environment and devices. Um, which is exactly what we want. Um, there are some things to work out, as I said, with, with larger networks. Um, okay, yeah, and uh, for the future, um, we need more testing and more complicated networks. Uh, I've only shown you plots of like uh, two different devices. Of course, that's uh, scientifically speaking nothing. Um, Actually, I have some more data now, which uh, we might look at during the workshop. So uh, we might see some some more evidence uh, if I'm right. <laughs> and um, also, um, we could uh, try also not not in, so not in the workshop, but uh, I should try in the future to find some better math to fill the data. Right now, we um, only used uh, what people did before, basically. And uh, one other big thing is uh, to optimize the hardware, uh, for um, especially for the passive listening stuff, because um, as you've seen, we did that with a USB oscilloscope. That's not really a comfortable thing to, to add to a network. It's rather expensive. It's um, not very handy. Um, and actually, point three is already coming along somewhat. Um, maybe you've seen, um, I, I held that up into the camera once before. Um, it's the, the thing you, you um, see on the slide as well. Um, it's a, um, a board we, we developed which um, can be connected to, to KNX, um, KNX networks and uh, it can do passive listening. It can um, also uh, to get around this, um, this, this low traffic limitation somewhat. It can um, send out KNX packets uh, basically questioning all the devices to send it some, some serial number response or something so that it can compare um, basically dev devices and uh, it can try to compare what the devices say they are to what it thinks they actually are. So this is um, a first step in that direction. Okay. Um, thanks for watching everyone and uh, yeah, if uh, you're looking at this um, for the live Q&A session right now, then uh, the time has come. It's question time and discussion time. Thank you.